Okay, we have with us today Adrian Richardson. He's from Melbourne. He has a restaurant called La Luna and he also has other restaurants. And I think you, Adrian, you have a TV show too, don't you? I, I have a couple of TV shows oh, that are on at the moment. Busy man. You can watch uh, Good Chef, Bad Chef, and there's no prizes for guessing which uh, chef I am. Uh, slightly naughty at times. Um, there's also uh, Secret Meat Business, where I cook meat, my favourite meat dishes from all over the world. You'll see that, that show on all the time. Richo's Bar Snacks is another one that I do, which is uh, I make cocktails and lovely uh, bar snack food, and it's a really nice one. And there's also a show I did called Boys Weekend, wow. where it's myself, Gary Megan, uh, Manu Fidel, and Miguel Cascales. Uh, we travelled all around Australia, cooking stuff from all over the place and having a lot of fun. The uh, problem with that show is I did need a liver transplant after uh, oh, I was completing say, that it series. It sounds so, like uh, the Naughty Boys weekend to me. Very, out very around. Naughty I Boys. I can just imagine. I'd love to be a fly on the wall. And we also have uh, with us Angelo. Angelo is. Um, he's going to do a curtsy. There Adrian's um, <laughs> sous chef, and he's going to be helping. They have some beautiful aged beef here as well that they're going to work with. Um, and do you have a book in the merchandise tent at all? I, I don't have a book. I have two books, uh, yep. Meat by Adrian Richardson and uh, The Good Life, uh, but they're, they're not here um, oh, in the okay. merchandise. But, yeah. um, available but online somewhere? I think if you get online, adrianrichardson.com or something, you can order them online. And yep. I will personally fly to anywhere in the, in the world and bring it to you and sign it. So, um, yep. Believe Excellent. Yeah. And, and I don't think Adrian's got a plane to catch in five minutes, so I think you've got him for a little bit longer. No, I don't. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do a demonstration here, and then I've got a couple of days of preparation. I'm doing a dinner, uh, a lunch on Friday, and a dinner on Friday, uh, and in the chef tent over there somewhere. This place is huge. I can't believe it. Just, and, and you've got to be careful where you step. Um, because there's, there's squishy cow stuff on the, uh, on the ground. So you've got to be real. I'm learning. I'm a city boy. So um, I'm just sort of learning my way around, uh, around cattle. So I'm learning, learning about that. Now, should I get started now? Uh, get I? going. Oh, okay. I'm not going to interrupt any longer. Adrian's a great talker and we'll leave him to it. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, come on, give me some love. That's better. Here we go. Now, I have a piece of beef here. A beautiful piece of beef. This has been dry aging in a cabinet that we have over there. This has been dry aging for about two weeks. It still looks nice and nice and red because uh, the dry aging cabinet does put a little bit of moisture in there, keeps it nice and soft. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you how to cook the perfect steak. And there's people looking at this camera all over the stadium and everyone's thinking, Richo, we know how to cook a steak. We've got a barbecue at home, but do you? How about you learn from the expert on how to cook the perfect steak? And that's what I'm going to teach you how to do. Hopefully, if you follow my tips, you'll be able to cook the best steak in the world and people will be chasing you down to cook a steak. Now, the thing you start with, this is, the, uh, is the, from the rib, it's the porterhouse. We've got the, uh, the neck end here and the bottom end here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take it off the bone. So just with a, with a good sharp boner, you want to go around this rib bone here and take it down. Now, you will notice if you've got dry aged meat, the meat is actually quite firm, so you really have to be careful to make sure you take it all off nice and neatly. Now, if you come in here, I'm going to bring the camera right in tight. Can you do that? Are you allowed to come in tight? There we go. Do I have to grab you? There we go. I'll just grab him. That's it. You can come in real tight if you want, and you can have a look at this. Have a look at that. So just with a sharp bony knife, you just go around the outside here and snap it off. Hear that sound? That cracking sound? That's what you don't want to hear when you go to a chiropractor. You know what I mean? That's, that, that tells you it's going to hurt a lot. So I'll just take that little piece off there. Off it comes. And then with this knife here, I'm just going to go across the top of these little feather bones. Just sort of mark it a little bit. And then I'm going to cut it through the middle here. Now, if you do manage to go to my restaurant, La Luna Bistro or Bouvier Bar in Melbourne, we dry age our beef on the bone for eight weeks. I buy whole argies and we hang them in there for, for eight weeks on the bone and then we break them down. We have some of the best beef in Melbourne, and I can assure you of that. Now, with the bony knife, you go over the top of the feather bones here. You see in there on the screen? Is that looking good on the screen? Oh, look at that. That's much better. There we go. So I'll just go around the outside there and just loosen them up. And then, look at that. That looks good. And then straight down the other side here. Now, I hope you've got a couple of people to clean up the mess. As you can see, I am really messy. And when I do the TV shows or I'm working in the kitchen, I leave mess everywhere. And when I cook at home, my wife's always saying, you know, when, when is the uh, kitchen hands going to clean up after you? So it's just a matter of coming down the outside here, if we can go there, and then all the way down the side here, 
Oh, this is looking good. This is a beautiful, beautiful piece of steak. And around the side there, around those little nod nodules around the side there, this is beautiful beef. Look at that. Now, we use a lot of, uh, a lot of British breeds down south in Melbourne because we have what we call grass and lots of water in Victoria. So the grass grows up underneath them, and the cattle don't have to move very far. They just sort of, um, you know, they don't move very The grass grows up underneath them, but it's a bit different up here. You've got lots of space and lots of grass growing, and the cattle love to eat that as well. But this is a beautiful Angus piece of meat. Off it comes like that. There we go, around the side there, and off it comes. Have a look at that. Come on, give me some love. There we go. Now, to me, this is one of the best parts. This roasted in the oven with plenty of salt on there, and you just eat it like sort of caveman style. You know, like uh, Barney Rubble? He would be eating this. That's the best part. Now, I'm just going to go straight down through the middle here and take out a nice big piece of steak. And as I do that, I'll open it up so you can see it. Oh, look at that. That's delicious. See that marbling in there? Can you see that? That marbling, that's what we like to eat. That's the fat. That's what, makes us that's, what makes us that's what makes the meat taste really good. The more fat in the meat, the more marbling, the better that meat is going to taste. It'll kill you for sure, you know. It's not going to extend your life, but it's all about the flavor, and that's what we like to eat. So I'm just going to cut through this piece here, and I'm cut a nice, big, juicy piece of steak. Now, I know that up here, I could grab this piece of steak, and I could throw it on the barbecue, and you guys would love it. But down in Melbourne, they're a little bit finicky, so you have to take the sinew off for them, take the fat off for them as well. So I'll just trim it up for you so you can see what that looks like. So I just take the sinew from this side here with a sharp bony knife, and you'll see I'll just go underneath there, around that sinew, up and down, and then straight down like that. And then I'll do the same around this side here. And I just keep a little bit of this fat on the outside. That is one of the best little pieces. Got fat going everywhere. We don't want to waste that, do we? That's from my, I've got a little puppy dog under here. Just feed my little puppy dog. Here you go, Fido. There we go. And that is a beautiful piece of meat. I'll just trim up some of that sinew because down south, they have, uh, they've all got dentures down there, so you need to take off those pieces. Now, have a look at that. I'm going to come nice and close. We've got lovely bits of sinew in there. We've got beautiful color on that steak. We've got the fat on the outside, a little bit of uh, muscle over here. This is a beautiful steak. This is a porterhouse steak. This is one of the best steaks you can have. Now, I'm going to put it on the grill and start cooking it. If I can figure out, oh, here we go, paper towel. One of my favorite things, paper towel to wipe things up. Here we go, get that off my hands here. We don't have a bin, do we? So what I'll do is, there we go, we'll sort that out. Now, when you've got a steak, one of the most important things when you've got a beautiful steak, and I reckon you've gone to your favorite butcher, you've got a nice piece of steak, you're prepared to pay more for the steak because the more you pay for the steak, the better it is, generally speaking. So if you're going to eat a good piece of steak, you're better off paying more for it, and then you'll enjoy it a lot more. So I'll just take my fry pan here, pop it over here, turn this thing on. Here we go. And there we go. That'll start up there. Now, what we need to do is we need to put some salt on this steak. Salt is really important because salt loves meat, and meat loves salt. It's on the T-shirt here. Here we go. Have a look at that. Salt loves meat, and meat loves salt. If you put salt on your meat, it'll make it taste good. And don't worry about, if you're worried about having too much salt in your diet, just don't put any salt on your veggies. No one's going to eat them anyway. You know what I mean? It's all about the salt on the meat. Now, if you're worried about, you know, maybe you're having a heart condition or something, you might want to turn away for a second. I put plenty of salt on my steak. And that's what a lot of chefs do. And that's why when you go to a restaurant, everything tastes good, because we season it up. And you thought I was only putting a little bit on. I put salt on every single bit of it. And if I've got any salt left over, I just throw it over my shoulder because the devil is always looking over my shoulder. In fact, he's always looking over both, sides, both shoulders. So poke that in his eye. Now we've got our salt on. We've got a little bit of pepper to go in there as well. Here we go. A little bit of pepper on top because we want to make it nice and tasty. And have a look at my fry pan here. You can see it's, it's, you can see it's actually uh, starting to smoke up, which is what we want. It's probably just over the top. A little bit of olive oil on here. A little bit of olive oil on the steak because we've got a bit of fat in there. We don't want to fry the steak. We just want to help the heat transfer from the steak. And when you put the steak in the pan, you want to hear this sound. Can you hear that sound? That's the sizzle, plenty of sizzle. You want to have plenty of sizzle in your pan because that's what sears the outside and locks in the juices. Now, if you're looking at this, you're thinking, Richo, 
Where does this actual cut come from? Now, Angelo, would you like to hop up here for a second? I just want you to show you where this cut comes from. I'll take this meat over here and put this over here and grab this one here. I'm going to show you where this actual cut comes from. What's that? Are you going to get on the bench? Okay, up down there. That's perfect. Now, the porthouse. Now, what, you, what I want you to do is imagine that Angelo is not a great chef. He's actually a prime steer from down south. Now, I want you to, he's walking around the field, down on the floor here, Ranch. He's walking around the field, nibbling on daisies and green grass underneath the sunshine that we sometimes get in Victoria. You know, it's raining. And he's just roam, roaming the field. So he's not actually Angelo. So he's a steer. Can you imagine this for a second? Now, I'm going to show you where these cuts of meat come from. Down we go, Ange. Now, Ange is not Greek, as you're probably thinking. He's Italian. So I'm going to show you where the cuts. Now, if you look on the shoulder here, if you want to come up here, Tiger, that's it. Bring that camera up here, over the top here. There we go. And what I want you to see, see this part here? This is the shoulder. This is where the ribeye comes from, the scotch fillet, cube roll. This is where it comes from here, and it's on both sides. And then, of course, we've got this piece down here. This is the porterhouse or the strip loin. Great porterhouse steak, that's what I'm cooking here. Great flavor, nice bit of texture to eat. Now on the inside here, we're lucky that Angelo is a steer because you'd never put your hand underneath a bull. Underneath here on the inside of his belly, that's where the tenderloin is or the eye fillet. Beautiful piece of meat. This is, of course, a T-bone. And my favorite cut is, of course, the rump. One of my favorite pieces. You like that, Angelo, didn't you? Shall we do it again? The rump. There we go. Oh, come on, Angelo. Here we go. The rump. That's one of my favorite pieces. And we'll turn that steak over there. Can we give Angelo a round of applause? Come on. He didn't know. He didn't expect that at all. There we go. Now, you just saw me turn this steak over, which is really important. People say, how many times should you turn a steak? And depending on where you go in the world, people say, turn it once, turn it twice. Well, I turn it as many times as I can. Um, I will turn it five, six, seven, eight times. Uh, the turning of the steak is really important because when you put a steak on heat, all the juices, all the flavor, all the moisture in that steak is trying to escape through the top. So if you leave it on that one side, all the juices will come out the top and spill out, and that's not what you want. You want to fool those juices. So every time you turn over the steak, you fool the juices into turning around and have to try and come up again. And when they get to nearly the top again, you turn that steak as well. So I turn my steak every minute or so. And if you come over here, you can see I'll even stand it up on the sides here. So I see the outsides of it. Can you see that? Oh, look at that. You got a good view from there, haven't you? Oh, we're using the other camera. We've got cameras all over the place. Oh, there we go. And we'll do this one here. Sear it on the outside here. And you can see that it starts to sear. Can you smell it? Can you smell this steak? The wind's going that way. Can I just tell you it smells delicious? It smells the way Australian beef should smell, beautifully, nice, nicely sealed. Now, that's, the, uh, that's our beautiful piece of porterhouse that's coming along there. And all we need to do is just keep turning that every couple of minutes to allow those juices to sear on the outside. And while you're cooking your steak like this, it's a great time to make a little salsa, something really simple that you can put together to make it even more delicious. And I've got some cucumber that sits here, and I've got some tomatoes, some lovely little fancy colored tomatoes. And you don't need a lot with a steak. People often, when they cook a steak, will have chips or potatoes, those sorts of things. I find it gets quite heavy and sits on you. If you have something acidic, like a tomato salad, nice and fresh and zingy, especially in this heat, it's one of the best things that you can have. And I'll put a few tomatoes in there, a little bit of pepper in there as well, and some salt goes in there as well. A little sprinkle of that, some cucumber. And then back over here to turn this steak over like that. Oh, that's looking beautiful, isn't it? Some extra virgin olive oil in here. There we go. Up nice and high. See how chefs do it? We just squirt it. And the other reason we just squirt it like this is because we don't have to clean it up afterwards. We just throw it around, make a mess everywhere. Wouldn't that be nice if you could do that? Just throw salt and pepper all over the place and someone else will tidy it up for you. In goes some pepper there. And then a lemon. I'll just squeeze that all the way through here. Nice, quick, simple little salad. Plenty of lemon juice in there to give you some tang as well and some fresh thyme over the top of it. That's all you need to make a nice, simple little salad that'll go beautifully with it. Now, this is the other thing. With our steak, once we've cooked it, and I reckon we're just about ready, people say, how do you know when a steak's cooked? Well, I've been doing this for a long time, so I can have a look at it, and I just feel it with my finger like that. I know that's nice and rare. And another way of doing it, this is the old school analog way. You pop a little skewer into the middle like that, let it sit there for a couple of seconds, and you take it out, and feel it on the bottom here. And if it starts to feel warm, you know it's medium rare. 
But I'll tell you what, the surefire way of cooking a perfect steak every single time is one of these things here, a digital thermometer. I'm going to show you that. Now, you can go to adrianrichardson.com and you can pay 60, 70 bucks for one of these. Or you can go down to the homeware store and pay 20 bucks. But the ones you get from me will have my signature on them. They're really valuable. This gives you x-ray, this x-ray vision into what's happening on the inside of that steak. If you know the temperature on the inside of that steak, you know how it's cooked. I know that at 35 degrees Celsius, it's cooked rare. At 45 degrees Celsius, it's medium rare. At 55 degrees Celsius, it's medium. And anything past that, I don't want to know about. But that's how you know. So what I do is pop the digital thermometer in there. It gives me a reading. It's telling me 33 degrees Celsius. I know it's rare. So I know that this steak is perfectly cooked. And if you're cooking for a whole lot of friends at a barbecue, what you do is you pop this in your pocket. You tell your mate to go over there, get a, get a, a beer out of the fridge. You pop this in, take it out again, get a reading, and you know exactly how it's cooked. And then when he comes back again, you take it off and tell him it's medium rare and it's perfect. And that's what you want to do. So once you've got the steak cooked, off it comes. And what I'll do is I'll bring it over here to my board here. Now, this is the next thing that's really important. When you cook meat, you've got to rest the meat. And the reason you do that is because when you cook meat, you're using high temperatures. What you're doing is you're squeezing those muscle fibers and they're really tense. If you cut into it straight away, all the juices will squeeze out. You know, if you've ever taken a lamb roast out of the oven, popped on a board and cut into it straight away, you end up with all those red juices on the chopping board. Well, those juices belong in your mouth. That's what you should be chewing on. So by resting the steak for about half the cooking time, you're allowing all those juices to stay in the meat where they belong. And that's the most important thing. And then, of course, what, what is really the most important thing is, of course, trying it. And this I reckon is the best part in the entire world. This is why I enjoy being a chef. Now, I'll get a beautiful piece of steak like this and I'll just carve it into a couple of pieces and I'll just show you how easy it is. Nicely carved steak, fan it out nicely on a plate and it doesn't need to be complicated. Good food just needs to have some great ingredients and I'll do that thing that other guy, I don't know if you've seen him when he does this. Here we go, this goes everywhere when I do that. Just sprinkle a little bit of salt on there because we love our salt. And then with a spoon, we'll grab some of this lovely salsa and pop it in there. So we've got lovely, fresh little salsa, a beautifully cooked steak. What do you think of that, guys? Is that lovely? Nice and simple. Come on, give me some love. There we go. Hey, that's what we like. Now, the proof is in the pudding. I'm just going to have a little taste of this now. I'm just going to show you. This is what we do on TV. We take a little piece and... Oh, oh my God. So moist, juicy, tender, flavoursome, that marble flat through the ins that marbling of the fat through the inside. That is fantastic beef. Mm. Mm. I'm in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I hope you've learned something. That's how you cook the perfect steak. Thank you.